Welcome everybody to this afternoon's Climate Breakthrough Dialogue on Getting to Zero for Shipping. I'm Margie van Gogh and the lead for Supply Chain and Transport Initiatives at the World Economic Forum. We've heard in earlier conversations today that collaboration between sector peers, investors, uh, local and national policymakers, and civil society is crucial to achieving deep decarbonisation and transformational breakthroughs in the early 2020s. This requires clear roadmaps and transparency between now and 2030. Shipping is no exception. An important first step by the International Maritime Organization in 2018 targeted at least a 50% reduction in shipping emissions by 2050. However, given technological development, the latest climate science and active engagement across the full maritime value chain, many suggest that the ambition for shipping should be to achieve zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. The Getting to Zero Coalition, hosted by Friends of Ocean Action, Global Maritime Forum, and the World Economic Forum's Mission Possible Partnership, unites many, unites many companies, 160 plus organizations, NGOs, academia, and governments around a 2030 ambition aiming to have commercially viable zero emission vessels already operating on deep sea trade routes within this decade. Ambitious focused leadership across the maritime ecosystem supported by national and international policy measures will of course be needed to ensure zero emission vessels are indeed the default choice by 2030. With this, I welcome and invite our panel of highly engaged leaders to share their thoughts, to discuss how their organizations are investing for a sustainable zero emission future and the support that is needed to achieve this. Our panel is moderated by John Defterius, former Emerging Markets Editor and CNN anchor, chair of the Agora Group and longtime friend of the forum, having led many catalyzing discussions over the past three decades. Before I hand over to John, I'd like to introduce, uh, sorry, to introduce our guests. It is my great pleasure to invite Rachel Kite, the Dean of the Fletcher School at Tufts University, to share a few opening remarks on a subject that she too is passionate about. Rachel presently chairs the Rwanda Green Fund and the Private Infrastructure Development Group's ESG Board Committee. Previously, she was the Chief Exec of Sustainable Energy for All and the World Bank Group Vice President and Special Envoy for Climate Change. Rachel, thank you, and over to you. Well, Margie, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. I'm delighted to be here. Just a few years ago, when we would talk about shipping at the World Economic Forum or in any other climate or sustainability-related intergovernmental meeting, this was always put in the category of very hard to abate, maybe impossible to solve, and um, the people in the room were really perhaps uh, those who were persuaded that... Uh, there was hard work to do. Here we are in May of 2021, a super year of sustainable development diplomacy, where the economic recovery from COVID coincides with the science which shows us the urgency of the need for an energy transition and a deep decarbonisation, and coincides with our understanding of uh, how perilously close we are to tipping points in the way in which we relate to nature. So all of this coming together, and we see uh, a, a sense of ambition, but a sense of commitment coming from coalitions of the willing in each of the hard to abate sectors, no more so than shipping. I think it's been very important that the race to zero and the climate champions of Chile and the UK have put their weight behind the ambition that's coming forward, in particular the idea that by 2030 we could reach tipping points by achieving 5% of uh, fuels for shipping to be zero emissions. That kind of pragmatism of how far can we get this decade in order to be at net zero in 2050 is important because it gives a toehold or a grapple hold to all of the different stakeholders that have to be involved. We can see and we will see on this extraordinary panel the opportunities for port to port relationships, the opportunity for investors if we understand that land based fuel production is the biggest part of the emissions curve that we have to tackle. But there are still questions out there that we haven't resolved yet. In a global shipping industry, what about flag states? How do we make sure that countries that depend upon shipping routes but aren't big players within shipping 
uh, do well and can see their way forward because we will need their votes at the IMO and we will need their commitment to fast progress. How can we continue to add people to these coalitions of the willing? How can we continue to uh, educate the investor community about what good practice would look like and not? And how can we perhaps have some unilateral action going forward with different shipping routes, uh, maybe for the ammonia and LNG production that they would only ship on uh, zero emissions vessels? How can parts of the shipping industry go faster, further, first, and then bring everybody else along? It's such an exciting time. This could not be a, a better timed conversation. Over to you, John. Rachel, thanks very much. Uh, Margie, thanks again for the invitation to, to chair the session, uh, getting to net zero uh, in shipping. I was hosting for CNN the Global Energy Challenge in 2019 and 20, and actually had firsthand experience here in terms of trying to make this transition. And boy, I think it's fair to say that the narrative has changed over the last three years uh, when I embarked on that project, with the original narrative being that the hill is uh, too steep to climb, that we can't make the inroads that everybody was asking for from the global community when it comes to shipping. Uh, the transition is underway, but it's not an inexpensive one, if you will, uh, particularly for the next uh, two decades. We're looking at an estimated cost of a trillion to $1.5 uh, trillion to make it uh, happen. And there are a number of options on the table. Again, if you go back just a few years that nobody was really discussing at the time, uh, Rachel touched upon them, ammonia, hydrogen, biofuels, even nuclear, uh, in terms of power for these uh, giant vessels. Uh, how realistic are they? And then we talk about the chicken and egg approach. Uh, if you declare there's an interest in this market from the major shippers, w will the major energy companies uh, meet the need uh, in the future? And that's clearly a point of debate. Uh, we have a fantastic panel, as Margie and uh, Rachel were uh, suggesting. Let me introduce them now. Lehun Kwa is the CEO of the Maritime and Port Authority, uh, joining us from uh, Singapore. Uh, Soren Sko is the Chief Executive Officer of AP Muller Maersk, the uh, Global Logistics Group, uh, joining us from Copenhagen. Jan Dielman is the Head of Ocean Transportation for the Giant Commodities Trading Group, uh, Cargill. He's joining us from Geneva. And Johanna Christensen is the Managing Director head and projects and programs uh, for the Global Maritime Forum. Uh, she is also joining us from Copenhagen. Before I jump into the debate, we have about 50 minutes to just get a lay out the landscape for us here. Um, we're going to have a, a Slido chat room there on the platform. We welcome your questions, and I would hope to have about uh, at least 10, if not 15 minutes uh, to entertain those questions. My only point is make them uh, brief and to the point. If you can direct them to one of the panelists, even better, and let us know where you're uh, joining us from uh, on the platform. Let me bring in um, Le Hun Kwa from Singapore and to discuss the new maritime decarbonization center that you set up there. Um, how will it, uh, Le Hun, uh, address zero carbon vessels, uh, the infrastructure on ports, which is often overlooked. And then this idea I was talking about here, fuel production, what comes here, the chicken or the egg, when it comes to the fuels that will power this industry in the future? Do you want to take it from there? Thanks, John. Uh, first of all, uh, I thank the World Economic Forum for giving me the opportunity to speak here. Now, um, to address uh, John's question, um, the reason why we actually want to set up this Maritime Decarb Centre is because we recognize that climate change is a global challenge which requires global collaboration and we need solutions. Um, this is particularly true for shipping because it's not just about shipping, it's about the energy uh, transition that's also taking place in parallel and also about the infrastructure and the port uh, infrastructure that needs to be put in place. So um, this is one of the recommendations uh, which is uh, by our international advisory panel which was set up uh, in 2020 with uh, 30 distinguished uh, C-suite leaders. And what we hope to achieve is definitely on uh, three areas. First is we actually want to encourage more private public collaborations. Here I mean uh, it's not just about the ship itself, but it's across the whole value chain as what John you rightly mentioned, uh, how to get the fuel in, uh, what is the port infrastructure, what is the bunkering standards, uh, what are the safety standards, um, and then it's to come together into play. It needs to focus definitely on collaboration, and I think we recognize, uh, and that's what we hear very clearly from the shipping community, that it is 
not one individual or one player who has the solution. So we need to come together to actually share such experiences and allow the solutions to snowball. And more importantly, I think it's really talking about this value chain ecosystem. So when we join in the Castor Initiative on Ammonia Fuel uh, Vessel, we aim to come up with the ship uh, by uh, 20. 2023, 2024, and there Singapore is uh, ready to welcome the ammonia ship to do bunkering. I think that is the type of value chain ecosystem that is required. Now, the decarb center is not just seen as solo. It has to be, it has to collaborate with other decarbonization center. And perhaps later, uh, uh, Soren can speak more about it because there is the uh, towards zero carbon center, which the MERS has also set up. And uh, together, I think in Singapore, with the different players together, we hope that we can contribute at least the safety center bunkering standards which are common uh, um, sort of uh, a game field for everyone and help to level up um, everybody towards global shift. Okay, thanks, Lehman, for being so direct and to the point. You raised the idea of a public-private uh, collaboration. And let me bring in Soren Sko here from uh, AP Molar Marisk. Um, can governments set up a framework uh, and particularly in this march to COP26, would you suggest, uh, Soren, uh, to facilitate the transition? And I, I don't want to suggest pick winners when I talked about those energy examples in my opening comments, uh, but to give a roadmap here and even a policy uh, apparatus uh, to make this uh, transition accelerate in a, a timely fashion. Yeah, I certainly believe that uh, we can get some help from, from governments. Actually, I'll be quite blunt by saying that today, business is ahead of governments on this uh, uh, on this uh, this uh, this agenda we need more uh, sense of urgency uh, frankly uh, obviously fossil fuels are quite cheap they're easily available very reliable easy to easy to to to, to get and, and 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 frankly that's tough competition for green fuels uh, and therefore, we need more. Uh, uh, we need need more more regulation that can start to ensure that we actually have availability uh, of of green fuels. Rachel already uh, referred to this in her opening remarks, but we we have some important dates coming up uh, this year in in, uh, in 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 IMO and 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 IMO in in our view needs to to deliver a, a market based measure. Uh, by 2025, that, that can be uh, implemented in the second half of this uh, this this decade. It needs to be, uh, you know, at a reasonable level that actually tries to level the playing field between much more expensive green fuels and fossil fuels. But they also have to very very importantly to include all greenhouse gases and has to consider the full life cycle of, of, uh, of the fuel. Uh, then I think we will start to, to push uh, uh, further ahead when it comes to getting new uh, green fuels uh, in, into the market. We and Singapore and others are working on the technical aspects uh, on the ships and what it takes to run on green methanol and what it takes to run on, on green ammonia. I'm actually confident now, having worked on this agenda for two and a half years, that we will solve the technical problems. Actually, we those are you know getting you know to a point where we clearly understand what the issues are and also what the solutions uh, are likely uh, like to likely to be. The next, the next, if you will, stage on the journey that is actually figuring out how to make the the green fuels uh, available. Okay, thanks, Soren, very much. You talked about the, this basket of fuels uh, and this gap. I was going to suggest uh, the terminology that we have in the UK uh, in the underground system, mind the gap. What do we do, would you suggest, Jan, at this stage from a cargo perspective uh, to address the gap? Is that the role of government to say, okay, we do need to finance this transition because of the gap between the hydrocarbon fuels in the market today? Uh, and the uh, the green basket, if you will, that's coming to the market. Uh, what needs to be done in the transition near term to accelerate uh, adoption? Well, for, well, thanks for that, and thanks for having me. And I think some of it is also very much linked to to what Suren said and what Lehun said earlier. I think it's a basket of things that needs to happen, and I think we need, all need to keep on focusing on efficiencies because every drip of efficiency is going to make the problem uh, smaller going forward. So I, I, I would really uh, see us keep on going on that. And ourselves, we've been very much involved in wind technology, which we all know is not going to be the zero carbon uh, solution, but it will help at least to reduce the problem 
problem and the green premium or as the mind the gap as you call it so i think that is one i think the other thing is is uh, things like the institute that was talked about earlier is the collaboration because the technology i fully agree with sir is going to be available but how are we going to scale this and the scaling is going to be the, the the big issue and i think if you really want to scale it you are going to come back to policy where putting a price on carbon and and leveling the the playing field between those fuels is, is absolutely needed to to really make uh, the next step in this but i think it's a mix of things and uh, the private sector is, is doing its bit I, I clearly see that and i think it's now also up to governments and the imo to uh, to weigh in Okay, Jan, very quick uh, follow-up. Uh, I've heard from others in the industry that the IMO was being a little bit too conservative uh, initially with the, the targets. Is that a fair comment here? And that there's a kind of wake-up call uh, to the industry to, to step on the pedal here uh, and uh, be more aggressive? Yeah, I, I do think you need to put things in perspective. And it was, was said earlier on, five years ago, I think uh, there was a lot of noises saying that shipping should be completely excluded of this topic. Uh, mm. Then the 50% reduction came by 2050. And I think, uh, to me, it's just a question of when we're going to say it has to be zero and not if, because I think we're already past that station. I think uh, the momentum is growing in the industry, but also outside the industry. And I think the technologies that we're working on are already zero carbon based anyway. So I, I think it makes a lot of sense to, to raise the ambition level, which hopefully also is a catalyst for some of that regulation that we need. OK, I'll bring in Rachel Kite after that on uh, the, the, the worthiness of setting targets. But I wanted to bring in Johanna Christensen of the Global Maritime Forum, which uh, those in the industry know has been working with the World Economic Forum and the Friends of Ocean Action to create getting to zero uh, coalition. Would you say, Johanna, there's a particular focus here on 2030 uh, and on this net zero uh, progress that uh, Jan was just addressing here to accelerate uh, full decarbonization by 2050? What's the interim uh, goal here? Yeah, so that's on two levels, actually. So um, the reason that we focus so much on 2030 is because of the average lifespan of merchant ships that have, you know, that, that comes to about 25 to 30 years. So so in order to meet that those decarbonization targets, zero emission vessels really have to start entering the global fleet by 2030 at the very latest. But not only that, their numbers have to be rapidly scaled up through the, the 30s and 40s. Um, but as others have pointed out already, shipping's decarbonization is not really done with the ships alone. <laughs> so we've had research done that shows that around 90% of the investment needed to decarbonize shipping will be in land-based in energy infrastructure. Capacity needed to put zero carbon fuels, the distribution, storage, bunkering infrastructure for their supply, etc. So it's really a challenge that shipping can't solve on its own. And that's the basis on which we founded the Getting to Zero Coalition. The coalition now unites more than 160 companies from across the maritime value chain, including not only shipping, but importantly, the energy sector, and that's both the sort of the, the fossil fuel industry, but it's also the, uh, the, the uh, new entrants, if you will. So the incumbents and the, and the new entrants that are, that are, that are, that are looking to develop uh, those new green fuels, cargo interests, OEMs, banks, governments, and other stakeholders around this collective objective of having commercially viable zero emission vessels operating along deep sea trade routes by 2030. But I think another important component that, that, that we're sort of honing in on now is, is something that Rachel mentioned in her in introduction, where um, we've been working on what we call shipping's tipping point. So all industrial transformation pretty much follow an S-curve. So it starts with a slow emergence phase, a phase where there's rapid learning and the costs start to come down of new technologies. And then there's a sort of a diffusion phase that starts with rapid adoption of new technologies, positive feedback loops that raises confidence in the transition, more demand, investment, et cetera. And then the curve flattens out again, um, where there's reconfiguration and sort of a new normal is established. And we've done some work together with the COP26 climate champions and and UMass, where we estimate that about 5% adoption rate of zero emission fuels by 2030 could be that tipping point for shipping. So that's that's kind of, that's a, a sort of a more specific goal that we're working towards. And there are some really specific ways that that could be achieved. I mean, we've already heard from, from Soren that container shipping is a front runner, front runner. They're close to the end consumers. So where the pressure is likely to be the greatest, but also where the conditions are maybe there to pass on some of the higher costs of those fuels to the end consumer. Um, 
uh, they also trade in a way that means that with relatively few ports and routes, you know, you, you, that, that accounts for a larger share of volume, so that makes it relatively easier. I say relatively, and I, and I hope Soren agrees. I, 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 Soren has a much harder job than I do. <laughs> um, and then uh, there are other, other sort of more, more niche trades that, that could make up some of that difference. So, uh, or some of that 5%, that's ammonia and LPG tankers that are also, you know, they already have the storage and systems and crew well adapted to these new fuels. Um, and there are other sorts of niche international routes that could really have good enabling conditions to be first movers. So that's really where we're honing in. How can we get those first movers going um, at scale so, so that we can reach that 5% target? Okay, Johanna, thanks very much for the uh, comprehensive uh, outlook here, both uh, near and uh, medium term. Uh, Rachel, I wanted to uh, bring you back in about this idea of um, assisting the energy, uh, the industry by uh, setting concrete targets. Does this, would this accelerate the development of the fuels that we've been talking about here uh, and uh, push this industry along in the right direction? Yeah, it's a great question because I think we're, we're really in a, in a new age where um, we were in an age of hybrid governance, where, where actually the private sector and government and science and civil society are sort of egging each other on in a way which has uh, not always been the case. And so, so, for example, the science is very clear that we need to be at net zero by, by mid-century. That then gets uh, understood by companies who have got long-range investment uh, R&D um, uh, decisions to be made. So why would you be investing in something that's going to be obsolete? You know, you need to be positioned for success. So you have private sector committing to 2030 targets or 2050 targets. You have investors thinking, okay, so if that's the direction of travel, we need to be there at 2050. Where am I investing? You see investor pressure. And then you see the public policy you know, not enabling that race to zero, um, but people setting targets anyway. And so I think where we have a situation now where the public policy internationally, that means the IMO, domestically, that's different governments, are going to have to lay the, policy, uh, lay the policy path so that people can race really quickly. And that means effective pricing. It means, uh, you know, putting, making some bets on green hydrogen and ammonia, especially uh, around port infrastructure. And so these targets, are actually speeding everybody up at the moment. And I think the very important thing is that every company that has committed to being transparent about its scope three emissions, so these are the emissions that come from its supply chain, its value chain, is going to be putting pressure on the shipping industry to ship its products and uh, in a, in a zero net, in a zero emissions way. And so this isn't about the industry evolving from the inside. It's about the industry evolving from the inside, meeting huge pressure from the outside. Well, that's an excellent point, Rachel, and thanks for that. Uh, the other element I'll introduce now, I think, is that money talks uh, and the Poseidon principles uh, where you see banks uh, holding to account uh, those in the supply chain suggesting we're not going to lend for fu uh, future expansion uh, unless you meet these principles. What sort of influence do you think this could have, uh, Soren, on the industry and decision making by the companies themselves? And how do you see it from your vantage point? Well, clearly, I think it's it's the right uh, direction to to go, and 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 it will help uh, incentivize uh, incentivize shipping companies to do the right thing when they when they order or order order new ships. I, I think actually, for me, and, and and continuing on 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 Rachel's point about you know companies setting uh, setting science based targets for their scope uh, scope three emissions, and especially our customers who don't produce anything, they rely on us uh, to to uh, to to come up with with uh, with uh, zero carbon, if you will, solutions or products and services, and and for us it, it means that we are really thinking more and more about this not as a capex or a cost problem but as a, as a business uh, business opportunity we are already today 
offering a, a transportation service that is carbon neutral, which is based on biofuel that we drop into the tanks uh, in the quantity needed for the containers that we have sold. And there's a significant uh, premium on that uh, product because the biofuel is, is more expensive, but it, the, the, the product is growing exponentially. And, and that's because some of our customers out there are actually putting their money where their mouth is in terms of saying, we want to uh, uh, get to net zero in our supply chains and we realize it's going to cost a little bit of money and we're willing to, to, to pay that. So, so for us, it's really about growing that, the availability of, uh, of zero carbon uh, products. And that's why you see MERS uh, for all ships that we order from now on, uh, all the ships that are at least uh, dual fuel capable so that they can they can burn a, 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 net, a, a carbon neutral fuel uh, if we can if we can procure such fuel. Okay, thanks very much for that, uh, Soren. Lehun, I'd love to get your thoughts because you have the decarbonization center in Singapore. We know that there's one in Copenhagen, which uh, Johanna can address as well. Um, how dependent, though, is the industry on research and development uh, at an accelerated pace? So you look at the take up of the electric vehicle. Again, if I had that conversation, you know, five, six years ago, people say you're nuts. Now we see all the manu major manufacturers with a uh, an EV in the fleet. Uh, how does this apply to shipping, uh, Lehun? Um, thanks, John. I think that's a very valid question. I just want to go back to what uh, Rachel mentioned about first mover, whether you can move first. I think at this point, actually, um, despite the pandemic, uh, we actually see many players coming forth to talk to us about this energy transition and this shipping transition that's going on. And uh, actually, I mean, I, I've been in the industry for about two and a half, three years. The momentum is just picking up year after year. Um, I would say that, um, for example, on um, on the Thorne's point on the availability of fuel, it is true. I think for all port authorities like Singapore, we are preparing for a multi-fuel transition. In the transition, I think there will be a few different types of fuels because different companies are going to test bait with different fuels. So there's ammonia, there's LNG that is already established, there's biofuel, there's some who are going for carbon capture. Um, the long-term solution, people are looking at hydrogen, and that's true. However, the molecule is too expensive. We don't have a proper hydrogen uh, tanker carrier yet. So these are where technology still needs to come in. And I think the key is really about uh, scaling up. Uh, once you have the technology solution, whether we can find that S-curve, which uh, Johanna mentioned about, and uh, how we can reach that scaling up, I think financing needs to come in in a bigger way. Whether at the global level, for example, this International Maritime Research and Development Fund that industry is putting forth to the IMO and moving forward towards it, having a fund to go into the technology research. And I think private sector-led financing needs to come in. Uh, Poseidon principle, we have more institutions who are willing to come on board to offer certain prefer preferential uh, interest rates that will allow smaller medium enterprises who may not own hundreds or thousands of feet, 20, 30 feet to also come in and start buying the ships. So these are some of the areas that I think uh, needs to go in parallel if you're looking at scaling up uh, at the global level. Okay, thanks, uh, Lehun. I, I wanted to take a question that we have from the, the Slido um, app, and I appreciate you uh, feeding in with our audience here. Um, I wanted to call upon Jan, but uh, I think he has a signal back. Jan, you, can you hear me there? Uh, you have to unmute your microphone, Jan, if you can. And I'll bring uh, Johan yes. into the Can you hear me? Then. Yeah, I can hear you. Perfect. Once Sorry you get back that. on the chair. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, here's a question from uh, uh, the audience. Uh, we talk about market-based measures. Uh, Lehun talked about it. Rachel talked about the desire, uh, if you get the incentive here into the marketplace. Uh, can I discuss the carbon tax? This is a big debate when it comes to onshore uh, and obviously one that uh, would be for the shipping industry as well. Do you have any strong thoughts on that, uh, Jan? Well, I think in the end of the day, uh, everybody would prefer to see a global scheme uh, because that is the easiest. I think the reality is that it's extremely difficult to pull off. Um, so, and that's why you see some of these uh, these local schemes being uh, pushed forward, like the ETS, and you might see some others going forward. So, I do think the preference is for a global scheme, but if that is going to take too long, I think the industry will just need to live with some intermediate steps because we need to get going on this topic. Okay, Johanna, uh, please, uh, from a trade association uh, discussion point, is this the time for the uh, global carbon tax in the industry? It's been bantied about, as you know, for at least a decade. Uh, and I, th I thought I saw momentum uh, going back two years ago, but it hasn't come to the fore. 
Yeah, so maybe I should uh, uh, allow me just to correct briefly. We're not a trade association. We're actually a not-for-profit foundation um, based out of Copenhagen. So yeah, whilst correct. we do have Thank members from industry or not members, contributors from industry, we also have philanthropic and government supporters, etc. So it's a it's a multi-stakeholder platform for collaboration. Um, and and yes, I agree. There there needs to be uh, so there are, there are a couple of different things that needs to be ha that need to happen in uh, preferably to Jan's point at the IMO, but there are other avenues to achieve that kind of the 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 closing of the the cost gap if you will uh rachel al already mentioned like a, a clear direction of travel towards uh to zero emissions so in other words making sure that the the targets at the imo are well aligned with the the targets that have been set at a global level uh through the paris agreement and and that are that are science aligned right so that's that's the first piece um the 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 uh, the carbon tax issues. So some kind of well, we should say some kind of market based measure. Uh, carbon tax is certainly one avenue for that, but one that is the, that really comes close to closing that cost gap. And you know we you know to instill confidence in the entire maritime value chain that the transition is going to be possible and that it's that we're going to be able to pay for it. Right. So and 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 that it's going to be commercially possible to do this and that we can do that ramp up phase uh, in in the 30s especially and. And it, I mean, we've like there's a there's a way to bring down the cost uh, or the the, the price uh, of it's a sort of the tax, if you will, um, if if the if the revenues generated are are recycled into subsidizing or supporting um, the uptake of fuel. So so there is a way to bring down the overall cost. So there's all, all sorts of different price levels that have been floated, but it is possible to actually make that a price that's much closer and sort of within. I, you would even say sort of the price fluctuations that you see on 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 oil over the past even the past few years, which has been significant. So so that's that's really kind of where where we see this landing. And another really important point in this. And this is is that it that um, we look at what the impact is going to be on on climate, especially climate vulnerable countries and and the least developed countries. That we that we look at this from an equity perspective, um, because there are many countries that are going to be negatively in, impacted either from a cost the increase of cost in trade um, or the like. And so we need to make sure that it's an equitable transition. Okay, perfect. I'm going to bring Soren into this debate on the carbon tax. Do you want to weigh in, Soren, and your thoughts of it uh, being implemented in your view? Is it uh, realistic by 2030? Yeah, so uh, uh, in my view, we have one huge advantage in, um, in, in, in the shipping industry, and that is that we are globally regulated by the IMO. It's the IMO that decides the fuels that we are using. And uh, we just did that when we went to low sulfur fuels in, um, in, in, uh, in, on the 1st of January 2020, and, and, and it worked even though it was much more expensive for the, for the, for the shipping companies. And, and we can do the same here. So, so uh, that means that we can create regulation that creates a global level uh, playing field. And that is, you know, many other industries have do not have that opportunity. So, so we need to use IMO as a vehicle to 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 get get a level playing field and to to take regulatory measures that will help us get to a new new fuel. And that includes, in my view, uh, a, 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 carbon, a carbon tax or what I call a market based measure. We, we can start talking about that now because we have line of sight to what the alternatives are to the current fuels that we use. Two years ago, three years ago, we were not keen on a market-based measure because we didn't know what, what it could push us to. But today we're starting to have the point that, 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 that we actually know what the solutions could be. It's going to be some kind of combination between methanol or, or an ammonia. And, and you know, we know it's going to be more expensive and, and, and therefore a, a carbon tax is starting to make sense for us. And, and, and we're calling for that to, to, to get implemented in the second half of that uh, decade to help push us towards uh, the right kinds of fuels. Okay, thanks for the candor. I want to circle back on this idea that Johanna brought up at the Global Maritime Forum, and that is uh, how do you ensure equity in the transition? And, you know, as an emerging markets editor for CNN, I had traveled to different um, corners of the world looking at uh, port operations and economic parks uh, linked to the maritime trade. 
Uh, and if it's not handled well, the damage it could cause. Uh, Rachel, you have any thoughts on this? And then let's get uh, Lehun to weigh in as well. How do you ensure equity at the same time accelerate uh, this move to uh, zero emissions in your view? I think this 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 really goes to the heart of uh, of the IMO the IMO role because what I am what the IMO should should be doing now and of course the IMO is made up of its member states so um, uh, you know, they're not they're not it's not a separate body it's made up of its member states but we need the IMO to sort of tilt the playing field towards faster decarbonisation but also to equity which means. The technical support to uh, developing countries so that they can know how to use their, I mean, especially if they're flag states, they have all kinds of powers and, and uh, ways in which they can incentivize ships uh, under their flags to be uh, to be best in class. They have all kinds of ways in which they could potentially um, innovate so that they are demanding uh, net uh, zero, uh, sorry, zero emissions vessels under their flags or in their territories or in their waters. But they're going to need technical support to be able to do that. So, you know, levy, you know, levy taxes or levy prices on fuels, uh, take some of that and, and, and use that as a fund to help uh, developing countries benefit from this race to zero rather than thinking that they are going to be punished by it. So I, I think that there there are many other little, you know, sort of intricate things that the IMO could do, um, but that we need to start doing it now so that everybody sees that they have a stake in this and that everybody will benefit from it. Okay. Was it a mistake, Rachel, for the IMO to suggest an initial target of 2100? I mean, if people kind of raise their eyebrows and said, you know, the game will be over if we uh, don't accelerate this process in the industry. And I'm listening to the narrative of Soren and uh, Jan Lehun uh, in the industry, Johanna from the Global Maritime Forum's view on this, uh, is, is the IMO waking up to the fact that uh, the world wants action at a much faster pace? Well, tw 2100 is, I think you could consider it a political target, not a science-based target. Um, and I think we're in an era where consensus is being weaponized to sort of undershoot where we need to be. But the thing about targets is that they can be revised. And we're seeing in many other areas of the transition and transformation that those targets are being ratcheted up. So I, don't, I would expect at some point this needs to be ratcheted up, especially as people have confidence that we do actually know how to get there. Okay. Lehun, I, I wanted to t touch base with you and circle back on the whole idea of equity. You have a fantastic vantage point from Singapore into uh, markets like the Philippines and Indonesia as well. Uh, is it a concern uh, from the Southeast Asian view that this is managed correctly uh, with equity uh, for the developing countries? I would say that the inclusive agenda, like what Rachel said, is definitely important and is critical if you want to talk about mass adoption and moving the whole world towards together. So actually, I mean, if I could uh, just add in a point that we are a member of IM, where IMO is made up of more than 190 members. And the fact that there is a target actually is a good reference point. Um, and it, gener it has generated quite a number of, uh, a lot of momentum in terms of private sector and also quite a number of discussions uh, within IMO itself, whether it's about energy efficiency for a start, uh, we are coming up, with, we have already come up with an index and then moving forward, what are some of the market-based mechanisms? So these are some of the proposals which are on the table for member states to discuss. Now, what we need now is actually to see, like what Rachel mentioned, how do we bring um, other member states along? And that requires technical support and that requires sharing of information. So, for example, together with the IMO Secretariat, we developed this next-gen uh, uh, mechanism and platform. What we want is to build a platform so that we can have not just the private sector players, but also member states, port authorities to come and share some of our experiences and help level each other up. And these are, these are the type of uh, capability development and technical support which will be, will be very helpful to help level up different countries, whether it's Southeast Asia, Africa, or you know other parts of the world. And uh, I think this is something which we need to continue to work on because the least you want is to have member states feeling very left out and that you are not able to go along with it. And the key is whoever can go faster should be willing and as much as possible share the wisdom, share the knowledge and actually fund and get things going. Okay, thanks, Lehun. Another question from our uh, audience, and we appreciate them. Uh, this is uh, pertinent to our discussion that we're having now. Uh, what is the role of the value chain actors and the shippers in the short term? Uh, and this could kind of 
unlock that quandary of uh, where the demand comes from in the future. How can that help overcome the chicken and egg scenario that we talked about before uh, Johanna uh, raised it? So did Rachel. Jan Dierleman uh, from Cargill, do you want to jump into the debate on that uh, side, the, the entire value chain and the pressure coming from that? Yeah, no, and I think it's it's a it's a very good question, and I think there's been an initiative launched under the Global Maritime Forum as well, where I've been heavily involved. Is the whole Chicago Charter, which is really trying to create transparency around the topic. And I think what we've been lacking in the industry is also the transparency on emissions, and everybody's t- starting to talk the same language. And I think that has been a really good starting point to really look at end to end in the value chain. Where are some of the issues? Where are some of the opportunities? And I think that is a very uh, good first step at least to show a little bit more and shine a little bit of a light in the industry what what the levers are and i think that has been a good uh, starting point for us and looking at the whole value chain and not just the the shipping piece i would say okay soren what's your view from the uh ap marisk on on this but i I think frankly we are beyond the chicken and egg situation in our case because we already have ordered our first ship that's going to run on a green fuel and and we have said that every ship that we order from now on will have to be capable of running on a, on a, on a green fuel so so we are we are creating uh, creating that demand now we are scratching our heads trying to figure out how to satisfy it but 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 i'm sure uh, that we are we're going to get there and as we discussed before we are seeing in the container sector where the customers if you will are all the global brands that you can think of uh, that sell to consumers uh, that we are starting to we're seeing you know we're seeing customer demand for uh, uh, zero carbon uh, products uh, and we're seeing also a willingness to 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 pay a premium for 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 for, for that demand I, I i think that we will see a significant growth uh, uh, in 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 in, in uh, in, in this demand in the coming years, almost half of our top 200 customers have now set science-based targets and, and uh, they will need our help to deliver on those science-based uh, targets. So, so that, that's really where we, where we are. We, we, we are beyond the chicken and egg. We see this as a market opportunity, not a cost problem. Okay, Swan, thanks very much. I'm going to drill down and just open the floor up to everybody here in the boxes uh, on this. And how do you get a common standard? Uh, Lehun, you were talking about transparency and the need for transparency. Uh, how do you set the, the level playing field here for the developed and developing world uh, regionally uh, seen like to like uh, Asia to Europe and the United States and then going uh, south to Africa and Latin America? Uh, how do you get that common standard, Lehun? Is that the IMO responsibility? I mean, it has to be a global discussion and global initiative. So IMO uh, has already proposals that's on the table, and we need to continue to discuss that as member states. Uh, but one actually fundamental is really carbon accounting. I think that's where you need a common metrics in terms of accounting for carbon, and therefore you can talk about carbon credits and carbon exchange. So, for example, in Singapore, we are actually uh, trying to set up a climate impact exchange where you can actually exchange a carbon credit. So that's one of the few areas we need to look at. Uh, actually, I wanted to go back to the question, uh, topic on uh, energy, uh, the value chain ecosystem. We've been talking, in fact, quite a number of energy companies have been approaching us. And actually, there is quite strong interest there to try to align to where the demand is. In fact, many of them, they actually tells us, tell us that they have tanks. Um, they are actually interested to convert their tanks, to take in new energy. Uh, but what energy, whether it's ammonia, methanol, ethanol, bio, biofuel, is something which I think they are in the pr- process of making decision, which is why the value chain ecosystem, the question from the audience is actually very important. You need to form as many of that as possible so that you can generate the demand. Uh, and therefore, your energy companies will then move along with us and actually have the demand and energy in place. Okay. Uh, this is a, a natural follow-up to that. Who pays the bill for this? Soren said that consumers are very sensitive now. Uh, it was almost out of sight, out of mind, the shipping industry, uh, to the mind of the consumer. But because of the awareness of the march to um, 2050 and the Paris Climate Agreement and COP26 uh, in November this year in Glasgow, uh, is there a willingness by the consumer to actually pay more at the till for their products? Uh, has anybody done a gauge of that? Johanna, what's the, the debate within the Global Maritime Forum? Is there resilience amongst the consumer after coming out of a, a global pandemic, which is not over yet? Well, I think it, we need to bear in mind that at the end of the consumer, actually the cost is is 
tiny. So there's lots of different studies that have been done on this, but you know we're we're talking cents on the dollar, right? So it's it's a it's a really so while while the cost at the at Soren's end uh, for 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 a shipping company in terms of the cost of the fuels is is substantial at the sort of the end of you know where we're talking about whether it's sneakers or electronic products or whatever it may be, the the, the additional cost is actually um, minimal and thus we think it's something that the that the consumer can actually bear and that's where there's where there's only a tiny difference so so that that's not something that worries us i i think one also needs to bear in mind the the huge i mean to lay who's point the huge market opportunity that we have here i mean the five percent of um of zero emission fuels we've done some this i have to say this is like back of the envelope kinds kinds of calculations but that represents about seven million tons of green hydrogen that's a huge market opportunity for companies that are entering into the into the renewable energy space, right? And so, so I think when when Le Hoon talks about the the companies that are approaching them, the energy companies, uh, others, that's that's the that's the opportunity that they're looking at. This is a huge market opportunity. There's also an opportunity for developing countries here, because um, obviously um, these fuels being produced. Um, with the help of renewable energy or as a major input, um, that completely changes the energy landscape, right? There are lots of countries, the World Bank has done an excellent study on this um, that looks at all the different countries that could be kind of the, the, the energy exporters of the future. So this is really, really great. Um, there are a huge amount of opportunity there. And that's in all sorts of different countries. It's middle income countries, it's, it's lower income countries. So there's a, a, a really great opportunity to be explored there. Okay, or to take, Rachel, it, to be taken advantage of. I, well, I appreciate that, but the counter argument and, and one that we're watching very carefully here in the Middle East, if you think of Iraq, Iran, Libya, uh, Angola, Nigeria, stretching to Latin America, Venezuela, the overdependency on hydrocarbons and servicing uh, this industry as it is today. Uh, Rachel, the geopolitical risk in this transition cannot be overlooked. Uh, Johanna talked about the opportunity, but there's also the downside risk for the uh, major oil and gas producers. And I see your mic is muted. So if you want to uh, uncork it so we can hear from you. Yeah, the, so the, the, we're, 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 in a, we're, in a, we're in a transition. And so the transition means that geopolitically, uh, there is an opportunity to, to um, exploit the renewable energy resources that countries have. And that, that's, distrib that's distributed globally. Um, and then, of course, those, for those countries that are heavily invested in the oil and gas industry and deeply brown economies, then how they manage their transition is the most important issue. And that is why I think, you know, this year in particular, um, these issues are top of mind for the G7 and for the G20, not just for the climate talks in, in November. These issues are top of mind in the 14th and 15th five-year plans of China. And, of course, this is what Joe Biden tries to get through the U.S. Congress in terms of infrastructure bills, jobs bills. The, you know, climate runs all the way through uh, domestic uh, economic reforms and, and sort of geopolitics. So we, we're in a multilateral age with a great power rivalry, China and the US. How that great power rivalry works uh, in a decarbonized energy system, how multilateralism works as we deeply decarbonize is top of mind. Of course, for shipping, um, you know, as part of the connective tissue and part of the world trading system, that too uh, comes to the fore. So I don't, I don't think that it's, um, there are gonna be winners and losers uh, as we move from a fossil fuel economy to an, uh, a decarbonized economy. But who wins, uh, how quickly and how big of a win, I think is still still to be found out because, you know, countries are, are in, countries are each, each country is in the path of its transition right now. And um, there are opportunities to um, pivot quickly away from fossil fuels, um, even for the most uh, deeply carbonized societies. Okay, thanks, Rachel, for that. I know here in the UAE, for example, on the East Coast in Fujairah, uh, I think it's Uniper and uh, Neutral Fuels are experimenting with biofuels. And I wanted to get Soren's view and Jan's view about in our last six, seven minutes together here, where's the innovation coming from? What bets are you making uh, as uh, chief executives and uh, senior officials within your organization? Uh, Soren, did biofuels have a real chance here because of the cost that we see today? Or can the innovation drive that cost down? What are your thoughts? 
I mean, biofuels actually would be the perfect solution for us because we can we can uh, mix biofuels into the fuels that we already use today and thereby ramp up, uh, if you will, uh, 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 the usage of it. And, and price-wise, it's also uh, quite uh, manageable. <laughs> uh, I, I think to, to follow up on, the, on, the, on, the, on that question, uh, you know, if we double the fuel cost for Bursk, then we add uh, four billion dollars to to our uh, fuel bill. That's a lot of money. Uh, but if you start doing the math on the actual finished products, it's nothing. You know, a container can take uh, you know thirty thousand pair of sneakers. So that means you you know you're paying six cents more per sneakers or whatever for the for the extra fuel. So I think that part is uh, is quite quite reasonable. And you, you, the problem with biofuels is that nobody thinks it's scalable that we would be able to produce the quantities that we would actually need. Uh, we are using biofuel today in our eco-delivery product, and we think we can scale it this year and next year, maybe also if we if we are good at, at procuring. But but at, over time, we need something that can de deliver much bigger volumes. And there we need uh, we need the, the electro or the e-fuels or uh, power track fuels or whatever you, uh, you call them, such as, such as methanol and, and, and ammonia. Okay, good. Uh, Jan, did you want to weigh in on this innovation, which you're excited about? And Lehun, I'd love to hear from you on this uh, as well. Well, I, think what Surin, I think what Surin said was, 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 was spot on. I think uh, biofuels have a role to play, especially in the transition, I think. Uh, the problem is the scalability, the availability. Uh, what it does, you get the whole uh, food for energy uh, debate potentially. So there's a lot of knock on uh, discussions here as well. So they absolutely have a role to play. Uh, but for, if we really want to decarbonize and scale that, we have to go to the zero carbon fuels. And uh, I think that is, uh, that is the real path forward. Okay, Lehun? Yeah, same, same, same views as <laughs> Soren and, uh, and Jan. Um, biofuel technically is the easiest uh, to convert, uh, but in terms of availability and also in terms of competition with aviation, like should aviation pick up uh, uh, after the pandemic? Because aviation uh, tends to also, uh, is also looking at biofuel as one of the sustainable fuel that they can use. Then after, of course, we can talk about ammonia, but uh, toxicity is a bit high. So in terms of infrastructure and, uh, and port side of investment, it's a bit more tricky. Uh, hydrogen, I, as I said earlier, it's really something which uh, I think in the medium and long term, people are really looking at it. question is, how do we overcome the shipping of hydrogen, the issues, and how do you have um, uh, be able to produce green hydrogen, for example, in, a, in an economical uh, manner? Um, so, yeah, the, we are preparing, uh, Singapore is preparing for multi-fuel bunkering transition, and I think uh, it's a fact, it's a reality. Uh, we just have to prepare for that uh, and have different bunkering standards in the meantime uh, while waiting for that 2050 solution to come in. Okay, thanks for that. Now, there's been a lot of uh, announcements recently about uh, zero carbon vessels, and I had a chance to actually do some stories on in the last year. Uh, a lot of demonstration projects, if you will. Uh, do we expect more of it, and how do we go beyond the headlines of somebody saying, wow, that's interesting, but is it going to be pervasive in the industry? Uh, Johanna, what are your views on that in terms of the innovation of zero carbon vessels? I mean, it, it already is pervasive. And, and I think the, the kind of choices that, that uh, Soren uh, mentioned earlier and that Jan has, has also mentioned is, 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 is pervasive in the industry where, where m more and more shipping companies are, are, um, are, 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 are making the decision to buy only um, zero emission ready ships, so to speak. And that, that's, that's, that's a shift that's already happening. I think at the same time, we're also seeing big announcements on the fuel production side. So, so that is the... I think at least three or four different stories about big power to X projects happening, including in your region in the Middle East, right? So, so, so lots of the lots of this development is happening, and so uh, this is only going to go faster, not slower. Okay, good. So let's. Uh, we talked about the public-private collaboration at the start of our debate, and uh, we have about seven minutes left. I think I'd like to draw uh, a comment from each one of you in about a minute uh, each. Uh, what are the two priority asks, if you will? from a regulatory standpoint or from a policymaker standpoint. Uh, Soren, you addressed it here about uh, what governments can do, but if I was gonna give you a magic wand and say, this is what we need between now and the next five years, uh, what would you suge suggest they are? From a regulatory point of view, it would uh, definitely be uh, higher ambitions uh, in, in, the, in the IMO, uh, and it would be uh, in, the, in the form of a market-based uh, measure. 
a market-based measure that takes in, 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 that includes all greenhouse gases, not just CO2. Uh, and I'm saying that because I'm worried about the I'm worried about the narrative around uh, LNG, uh, and and it would and also for that reason it would have to be a a, a fuel that uh, that uh, that takes the full life cycle. You know, from from production of the fuel to to to, to when we use it in, into into consideration. Okay, good. You're you're speaking of methane here with the LNG production, uh, Soren. Is that what you're? Yeah, I'm, 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 I am. I, I think. I mean, I'm seeing in my own sector that we are seeing lots of people ordering ships with uh, uh, with LNG, LNG propulsion, which uh, you know some will argue is uh, is slightly less uh, in bits slightly less CO2 than uh, heavy fuel. I think there's actually a technical debate on whether that's true. Uh, mm. but, but but what's worse, if you order a ship today um, uh, for delivery in 23 or 24, and then it has 25 years of life, that means you're going to be burning a fossil fuel until 2048. I mean, there's no way getting around that. And so it's not a solution for us. I mean, it, it's just not a solution. And, and we should stop talking about that LNG as, a, as, as something that has something to do with climate change. Okay, very good. We know what Donald Trump's views were on trying to get that uh, LNG production uh, into the European market, obviously. So there's a change under the Biden administration, of course. Lehun, your thoughts in terms of uh, addressing what I was suggesting here in terms of policymaker um, advancements uh, to accelerate this uh, process? Yeah, um, technology advancement, I need the solution that's cheap, cost-effective, something that can scale up for the industry. So for this, I, I really think that, I mean, it's like if you look back, um, it's, it's like PV cell, you know, for solar energy. It used to be so expensive, people are not adopting it. So we need a um, mass uh, we need the mass scale uh, to take place. And from a policy perspective, more than happy, I'm, I'm really looking at seeing industry players coming on board, working with us, and we want to actually move with them to see how to make this, um, uh, to trigger a, a larger scale and nudging the momentum faster forward. So technology solution, I think that's the key. Let, let's put it on innovation, yes. It's just unleash it uh, if you can. Like, when I get the message. Jan, I think it's good to hear from you on this uh, thought. Uh, particularly from a, a large commodity group that ships all over the world. Yeah, no, I think I think some other things are are said right. We talked about the, uh, the, the the regulation piece. We talked about the technology piece, which I think is well on the way. I think it would be helpful if if governments help to somehow foster these connection points between industries. So between the land based and the and the and the shipping industry, mm. uh, the infrastructure piece, the 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 setting of standards, uh, safety standards, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think it would be very helpful that government can actually take a bit of an overarching kind of approach there and it doesn't become just a, a energy problem or a maritime problem and i think that is uh, something that can play a big role in yeah it's an excellent point uh johanna please and then i'm going to circle back to wrap up with rachel go ahead yeah, for me, I think the, the two most important things are sort of the support for industrial scale demonstration projects that can un help unlock some of the innovations and, and, and bring volume and scale and et cetera, all the benefits that come with that. And I think the other main thing for me is to deliver, deliver the policy measures that uh, makes zero emission shipping the default choice uh, going forward. That's okay. what we and my, well, thanks, Johanna. Didn't mean to step on you there. Uh, in my opening comments, uh, Rachel, and following yours, I was talking about the fact how fast the narrative has changed uh, in the industry. Uh, you're a, a, a observer here of the industry and what has changed over the last three or four years. Are you satisfied with the pace of the debate that we're having today? We had very candid answers from Soren when we have to revisit LNG and the entire uh, energy chain when making decisions for the next uh, quarter century. How do you see this industry shaping up at, at the pace that you would like to see? Well, I think what's exciting about now is that we, we have leaders in terms of ship owners, we have leaders in terms of ship builders, we have leaders in terms of port authorities, we have leaders in terms of the fuel uh, production companies, we have leaders on the uh, on the um, consumer end of it. So in every point of the value chain, there are now leaders and who are pushing the debate forward. And now really policy needs to catch up a little bit. So we need much more R&D investment. Absolutely. We need a focus on efficiency. Everything inland has got to be electrified. So set the standards that push that and then set the standards for fuel emissions uh, so that that drives point-to-point uh, -point innovation. Uh, and I, I think there's no reason why we can't get there. But I mean, from five years ago where 
there were a few leaders in the industry, but now to see in every part of the value chain leadership, uh, I think we need to push the public policy and the international cooperation pretty hard now. Okay, thanks very much. Rachel Kai joining us from Fletcher School. Uh, Soren Scow from um, uh, AP Muller Maersk. Uh, Lehun Kwa, again from Singapore and the uh, Maritime and Port Authority there as the Chief Executive Officer. Young Dierleman, thanks for uh, staying with us. Even when you had that technical problem at the start, you hopped right back in. Uh, joining us from Geneva with Cargill and Johanna Christensen, the um, Managing Director uh, for the Global Maritime Forum, joining us from Copenhagen. Uh, Margie Van Gogh, thanks for the invitation again to the World Economic Forum. And I'm glad to see uh, the debate moving more rapidly. And as Rachel was suggesting there, uh, it's the leaders now setting the pace. Uh, again, I've been following this uh, kind of closely for the last five years, and it's, uh, it's changing quickly. And let's hope it gets accelerated as we go towards uh, Glasgow at the end of the year. Also, a thanks to the technical team uh, behind and the editorial team at the World Economic Forum. The support's been fantastic. And last but not least to our audience, uh, very uh, provoking questions which uh, fostered the debate and the candor that we've had over the last uh, uh, 55 minutes. Thanks again for joining us.